We will now move on to questions to the Minister of Finance, and I call Stuart Dixon to ask the first question. Mr. Dixon. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. Concorda, there is still insufficient detail available on the Shared Prosperity Fund to make a final informed comparison, but I have a number of concerns where we may lose out. In my engagement with the British Government in this fund, I have repeatedly made the case for at least full replacement of spending power and that local control over spending is essential to ensure the fund meets local needs. The heads of terms for the Shared Prosperity Fund released alongside the spending review indicate that its full introduction would be delayed by a year, representing a potential loss of some £70 million of spending power for us. It is also clear when eventually introduced for 2022-23, it may not provide full replacement of spending power. We will have objectives aligned more to the English levelling up agenda than our local needs and have Whitehall based rather than local delivery arrangements. This is unacceptable, and I intend to case, make that case strongly to British ministers. Stuart Dixon, supplementary. Um, th- thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for your response. Uh, Minister, uh, clearly there are very serious concerns about central control of these funds, and can you assure the House that you and that this House will do everything in its power to ensure that, that such funds that are allocated will be decentralised to the regions and particularly to Northern Ireland? But, Minister, could you estimate for us uh, the amount of funding that is already received by your department and therefore that we can? work out what that loss might be? Well, the, uh, and the funding is not just received by my own department. I mean, of course, the European funding is across a range of areas, uh, and so we would have to take that. Uh, and actually, the more we analysed what the total loss, when you get beyond the European Social Fund and some of the big ticket items, there are quite a, quite a lot of small p- p- uh, pots of funding that go to various departments. So uh, I think we have to estimate that. But I know from looking at that figure and looking at what the British government have estimated in terms of their pilot scheme, uh, that we think we could be some £70 million pounds down. Now, uh, the other issue, of course, is uh, that one issue is replacement in full, which is a principle uh, that we want to see established. And the other issue is the ability for the executive uh, locally to set the priorities and to allocate the funding accordingly. Uh, and certainly the internal market bill that has been passing through Westminster seems to uh, wish to take that responsibility into Whitehall and align it to the levelling up uh, agenda that the British Government have, which in no way matches uh, the sort of agenda that we have here. So there's a very significant battle ahead. Uh, it, fortunately, in that, uh, I'm on the same page as the Scottish Finance Minister and the Welsh Finance Minister, and collectively we've been making the case and we will continue to do so. I call Matthew O'Toole. Mr. Speaker, um, I, I agree with the Minister on the need to be firm with the UK Government in terms of their obligations in delivering on no reduction in funding. Can I also ask the Finance Minister to explore every and maximise every other possible opportunity for Northern Ireland participation in relevant EU programmes to, in a sense, maximise the interpretation of the protocol when it comes to things like this, including things like the European Green Deal, which is a continent-wide plan to, um, for a just transition uh, and to overhaul our economy. Will he uh, pledge to be as um, ambitious as possible in seeking funding and participation in those programmes? Yes, absolutely. And it may not be. It may be the responsibility of other departments and other ministers to seek access to that funding. But certainly, uh, I will try and ensure that whatever uh, funding may become available to the executive through those programmes, uh, depending on obviously the outcome of the talks between uh, the British government and the European Union, uh, then that whatever we can access, that we do take full advantage, because we will. Uh, we are facing into a very challenging period, as he knows, in terms of the budget. Uh, in terms of potential loss of EU funding, uh, and, and I think we have to access where, whatever support we can, uh, wherever it is available from, and we will certainly examine what is available to us and make sure that any department or agency or body that can access that is aware and encouraged to do so. Uh, question five has been withdrawn, and I call David Hildich. Mr. Speaker, question two. The latest position on the localised uh, restriction support scheme is that 13,925 applications have been received, 7,025 of those applications have been approved, resulting in £49 million being paid to local businesses, 4,198 applications have been rejected. Members will be aware that further restrictions took effect for a two-week period from the 27th of November 2020, which placed restrictions on non-essential retail and some other businesses. In relation to those restrictions, over 2,000 applications have been received, 497 of those applications have been approved, resulting in almost a million pounds being paid out to local businesses, and approximately uh, 500 have been identified as ineligible. Staff are working through the weekend to clear the outstanding cases as quickly as possible, and I expect more payments will be released this afternoon. 
Call David Hilly, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the up-to-date position when this, when this question was entered in. Obviously, things were in a much worse state, and I would like to thank uh, LPS and indeed Mr. Snowden for their help during what has been a very difficult time. But the Minister will agree that perhaps when a, a, a business has not been paid at all, and there is another business beside it has now received two payments, it is unacceptable and, and sort of downhearted for some of the businesses not to have yet received. Yes, I absolutely get that. I mean, the purpose of these schemes is to get money as quickly as possible out onto the ground, and uh, you have to do it. And the applications have to match; they have to be correct. And uh, there was a, a high level, for some reason, in this of uh, applications were, were inaccurate in terms of business addresses, in terms of bank account details, uh, ineligible uh, for the scheme, perhaps applying for the wrong scheme. Uh, because bear in mind, particularly when a lot of close contact services closed, some of those could not apply through the rates-based scheme, they, they needed to apply to the Department of the Economy scheme, so there was duplication in that. So there have been uh, a high level, I think, of inaccurate applications and, and multiple applications to, uh, to deal with uh, in relation to some businesses. But of course, uh, LPS, as he rightly acknowledges, are working as hard as they can to get this done and get it out as quickly as possible. Well, Roy Beggs. <coughs> Mr. Speaker. Um, the scheme has been operating since uh, mid-October. Uh, I myself had difficulty finding a helpline number. I don't think one exists. Con so I am aware of constituents who are frustrated that they do not understand what is going on. So my question to the Minister is, when will a helpline number be established so that constituents can understand, did they tick a box wrong or why exactly they have been rejected? Because even responding to the, the email has been problematic on occasions. Well, if, if, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that it's a difficult to get through because most of the elected representatives I have spoken to have managed to get through. At times, it has been difficult. Uh, you know, there has been a backlog built up over weekends and things like that that uh, have proved difficult to shift. He has to understand that this scheme has changed four times since its original iteration at the start of October. It changed from Derry Straban to 11 council wide. It increased the payments and it added in additional businesses. So all of those changes have had to be factored into the payment out. Uh, and that has added to the complexity of all this. And I've raised this issue at the executive to say when, when health are coming forward with a series of recommendations, they don't often think then of, uh, understandably, they're, they're dealing with, uh, uh, if you like, a, a jigsaw to try and restrict the COVID spread. Uh, but then the consequences of identifying certain business sectors is that there has to be a scheme put in place to correctly and, and uh, accurately identify and distinguish those from other business sectors. Uh, and so I have raised that to the executive that the way these are devised it makes it actually adds to the difficulty of fighting and quickly paying the people who are caught up in the restriction. Uh, and so there are challenges and we will try and meet them and learn the lessons and continue to apply those, including communication. Call Melissa McHugh. From Adam, Carla. Uh, Minister, given that Invest NI uh, is this region's business grants agency, why is it fallen on LPS? A rates collection agency to uh, distribute business grants? Well, the member's right. LPS are a, a rates collection rather than a, a, the, the only grant paying body we have in relation to business is Invest in NI, it's in the Department of the Economy. Uh, but of course, when the pandemic hit, uh, a lot of departments offered to step up to the plate to assist to make sure that we were all trying to share the burden. Uh, of not only uh, getting funds to the front line in, ter in terms of health service but uh, and assisting them with acquiring critical supply, uh, but also in terms of meeting the challenge of businesses. So LPS stepped up in relation to paying out uh, for business properties that could be identified. Of course, the differentiating between some businesses which were in restriction and some were out uh, was an added challenge, and that has continued to be a challenge. Uh, Department of Community stepped up to pay social enterprise and charities, which wouldn't have been within their remit. Uh, and the Department of Infrastructure stepped up to pay taxis and coach services again, which wasn't within their existing remit. So other departments have stepped up to try and assist. Uh, and I often hear of the executive being criticised in terms of a lack of joined up approach. Th those are examples where departments have gone beyond their own remit and taken on work that they didn't have to take, but they needed uh, to do in terms of responding to the, the pandemic and what the public required. Well, Andre Muir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, is the Minister be aware the purpose of this scheme is to assist businesses which have been required to close as a result of the coronavirus public health regulations? Will the Minister commit to look at the issue whereby the overall business is actually allowed to open, but those businesses which are embedded within it are required to close, but they are not getting any financial assistance whatsoever? 
Well, I think what the, the member identifies is the complexity of business arrangements. You know, it's not straightforward. A uh, shop has to close, and therefore it's easily identified and, and paid out. That's on the rates base, and the applications put in correctly, and there was a, a lot of applications that weren't put in correctly. But there are multiple, I suppose, formations in terms of businesses, and, and it's getting to those difficult ones where it's a business within a business. Uh, uh, and of course, I would encourage those people to make sure all of those uh, uh, matters are made available to LPS so they can properly uh, assess that, but it does add to the complexity of considering the case, and sometimes you find it takes longer to consider those cases than the more straightforward ones, but uh, they are getting through them as quickly as they possibly can, uh, and we encourage people to make sure they have all of the up-to-date, accurate information, and we also encourage people to make sure and continue to check uh, their email boxes, their junk mail boxes, because often requests go back out for further information and are, are not uh, received or are noted to be received or recorded has been received, so uh, I encourage people who are waiting to make sure and continue that communication. Call Emma Rogan. Gourmet, good. can I call you question three? Well, this morning I visited the Footprints Women's Centre in West Belfast to announce the Dormant Accounts Fund. Footprints provides training, childcare and social enterprise model, as well as a social supermarket. Over the last 30 years, the organisation has developed and evolved and is firmly at the heart of its local community. The establishment of the Dormant Accounts Fund is a hugely significant opportunity for the community, voluntary and social enterprise sectors, especially as it supports services that wouldn't normally attract public money. The 20.5 million Dormant Accounts Fund will open for applications on 12 January 2021. By offering multi-year funding, it will provide much-needed certainty to community and voluntary groups and social enterprises. It will help them meet future challenges and adapt to be more financially resilient in the longer term so they can continue to make a positive and meaningful impact on many people's lives. I would encourage organisations to visit the National Lottery Community Fund's website for further details of the fund. Minister, I understand that the fund can be used for community asset transfer. Within my own constituency of South Down, a mental health charity, Mai Mai, is currently seeking a site from the Department of Education in Castlewell and the former Ardnabannon Outdoor Education Centre. Would this fund be appropriate for them to apply to? Well, I think in, in terms of perhaps building the case uh, to, to, to deal with the Department for Education, or indeed if the asset is transferred or, or, or bought or however it's exchanged then to develop the assets, but the actual purchase wouldn't come under the scheme because uh, there is an issue about giving out public money to, to buy back off government departments, uh, so it essentially comes back into them. So I think certainly in relation to it, and I had the opportunity to meet people from that project she talks about who are very impressive about the ambition that they have and the work that they're doing in that area. Uh, I hope they have every success in what they're pursuing, uh, but that, that scheme would be more for developing beyond purchase or indeed building the case to purchase. Call Pat Cadney. Um, I was just to ask you, Minister, uh, are you committed to this funding on a multi-year basis for the fund's duration to ensure that maximum flexibility and impact for Northern Ireland's followed in the community sector? Yes, the, the funding does, uh, and I think that's one of the key components of it, for, particularly for those in the voluntary community sector who tend to live on year-to-year -year funding, which makes it very difficult to plan. Uh, and to sustain themselves and to develop longer term projects which would uh, develop their own uh, capacities and, and, and resilience. Uh, and so this is for up to three years, which I think is important. It's up to £100,000, which is a significant amount of money for many projects. Uh, and so I hope that people will go and check out the uh, lottery uh, website and see if they can fit into that. It, of course, is also for sectors to come together uh, for broader than just simple uh, one singular project. It's for uh, various sectors to come together to enhance what they're doing, maybe in a collaborative way. Uh, but it is over three years, and I think that's an important aspect. Christopher Salford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, um, will churches be able to apply for support from this fund? The Minister knows whether it's uniformed youth organisations, mothers and toddlers groups, you name it. If the state was to pay churches for the actual work that they do, we, we couldn't afford it. So will churches be able to avail of this scheme as well? Yes, and I, I would encourage them to go on to the, the website and see how they may fit into that. Uh, of course, if, if, if it, it is for building capacity and resilience and, and, and you know, improving the long-term satin and ability of uh, 
of a, a scheme or a, a, a charity or a group uh, within uh, that organisation to sustain itself and to, to build its own capacity. So, of course, if they meet the criteria, I, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be able to apply. I call Mayor Mastori. My department has undertaken an equality screening exercise on the remedy proposals. This will be updated as necessary in response to the issues raised in the recent consultation on this matter. Responsible authorities for the individual public service schemes, including the Department of Justice in, uh, for the Police Pension Scheme, are also expected to undertake their own assessment of scheme level uh, equality impacts in accordance with existing commitments in their department equality schemes. My department is monitoring the scheme preparedness on all remedy-related matters as part of its regular interdepartmental engagement on the issue. Supplementary, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his response. Maybe he could clarify what he would see as the distinction between an equality screening and actually carrying out an equality impact assessment, because he will be aware that uh, in another jurisdiction, the Scottish Government has already commissioned a scheme specific in relation to a new QIA on behalf of the Scottish Police Pension Scheme Advisory Board. And he will be aware that there are a number of schemes uh, in Northern Ireland, not just one scheme, which particularly affects uh, police officers. And could I ask the Minister to ensure that there will be no inequalities uh, in relation to how this is rolled out and how this ultimately will affect uh, police officers. And while I'm on my feet, can I take this opportunity, just in case it uh, passes me by and, and maybe not have the opportunity tomorrow, to say to members in this House that we wish them a very happy Christmas, ever remembering that the message of this time of the year is that unto us a Saviour was born, and that's what we all need in these very critical days. Okay, well, and I thank the member for his, his good wishes. Uh, can I say the Department of Finance uh, screen exercise uh, is uh, generally in relation to Section 75 matters, uh, and so but the Department of Justice, which is a responsibility for the police, police pension, uh, would, would I, I presume, go then into the individuals involved in that scheme itself, where it's a more generic approach from the Department of Finance. We have a responsibility for monitoring all of that and for engaging with the other departments, uh, and I'm sure that the points that he's made will be picked up by officials in terms of their engagement with the other departments. But in terms of the actual impact uh, and what has been done in other jurisdictions, uh, I, I'm assuming that would be the responsibility for the responsible department, which in this case is the Department of Justice. I call Liz Kimmins. Corla, uh, can I ask the Minister what would the next steps be for implementing a remedy to the McLeod judgment? Well, the, 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 the Department of Finance consultation closed on the 18th of November. Uh, 443 responses were received and feedback to the consultation has been analysed and a response will be published early in the new year. And following the publication of the Department's response, I write to executive colleagues with firm proposals to progress a legislative solution to implement the removal of the unlawful age discrimination in the public service schemes. Call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd be grateful if the, the Minister could inform the House of what assessments are being made about potential implications for other organisations, not least the other uh, emergency services. Well, I think under this judgment there are substantial implications right across the public sector. Uh, and I, I'm assuming that for each department they're going to have to make an assessment of that. Uh, I know my own department is responsible for, if you like, liaison in an interdepartmental inter way, but I think there are significant implications. We've done the consultation, we've received responses uh, to it. Uh, I think the, uh, there are implications in terms of, of people's uh, employment and, and which, which scheme they have been in and, and which they would choose to go on with, and then for those uh, uh, f uh, into the future as well. But I think that the, uh, the, we will want to, I suppose, assess the consultation responses. We'll, uh, it'll be up to each department, I suppose, to provide us with the particular issues that face those departments and the, the public sector bodies that, that uh, are under their broad umbrella. But I think he's right, there are significant implications, and I think it's something that's going to challenge us in the time ahead. And I call Justin McNulty. EU successor funding will operate within the devolved sphere and as such I do not consider it appropriate for the British Government to conduct local consultations and therefore have not discussed this issue with them. I have emphasised the need to the British Government to respect the devolution arrangements and provide the devolved institutions with the funding to spend according to our local priorities. 
There is insufficient detail available on either the priorities for delivery arrangements or the proposed shared prosperity fund for us to carry out a sensible consultation exercise here. The British Government has indicated that more details will be available on a pilot programme in January 2021 and for the full programme in March 2021. We will reconsider the position then. Just make note, supplementary. Gurim, I would thank the Minister for his answer this far. Can I ask the Minister, has he engaged with Solace and the local government sector regarding a co-design and regional consultation approach to the shared prosperity funding? Well, the, the, the problem is, uh, as I was saying in response to Mr Dixon earlier, we don't have the detail in the shared prosperity fund to consult with people. Uh, and while I think Scotland and Wales have engaged in some consultation exercises, it's been quite fairly superficial and subject to change because the internal market bill, which is currently going through Westminster, would purport to take responsibility for designing uh, a shared prosperity fund, for, uh, for setting the priorities for it, and for actually applying the funding from Whitehall. And that's not what the understanding was for the devolved administrations. Ourselves, Scotland and Wales, clearly understood that EU funding would be replaced here, the schemes would be designed here, and the funding would be allocated here according to our own local priorities. So to engage with council groups, and I'm quite happy to talk to them at any time, but to engage with council groups in relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund at this stage would be premature because we don't have the detail to give them any advice. We have been engaging with others on Peace Plus and other matters which are progressing, uh, but in relation to this, there is insufficient detail and there is not even certainty as to whether we will be administering any of the fund at all. I call Gemma Dolan. And I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Minister, has the British Government guaranteed that CAP funding will be replaced in full? Well, the position on agriculture for 2021-22 is one where the main elements covering farm support have been largely replaced. We have been provided with £315.6 million. Uh, there is no certainty or guarantees beyond that. And of course, we will need to continue to liaise with Treasury on the position for future years. Keep Archibald's not in our place. Move on to Christopher Stalford. Question number eight, please, sir. Members should note that the rate relief awarded here to food retailers was much less generous than in other jurisdictions, whereas in other areas they were awarded full rates relief for the whole of this year. Here we only provided large food stores with a four month rates holiday awarded to all businesses. To date, Tesco and Asda are the only supermarket chains to contact me directly to say they would like to return their rate relief. However, I am aware that other large retail chains operating here, including Sainsbury's, Lidl, B&M Bargains and the Kingfisher Group, which includes B&Q and Screwfix, intend to play, repay the rate relief as well. My officials are currently engaged in the Treasury, along with other devolved administrations, on how the return of the money will be handled. It is anticipated the money will be returned by the large retail chains change to the Treasury and then reimbursed to the Executive. Mr. Stafford, Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in the midst of all of the suffering that has taken place in the uh, wider economy, one sector has done very, very well out of things presently, and that is obviously the big, big multinational um, supermarket chains. So, when this money is brought back to the centre, will the Minister commit? to reprofiling it in order to further help small businesses in the community? Well, of course, it, it will be up to the executive to decide how to spend any uh, funding which comes back uh, to that. I can make recommendations, and I would certainly like to see uh, that funding, because it was COVID-related. Uh, and, and the reason I mentioned it was only for four months here is because the amounts that have been talked about come back in Britain will cover a 12-month period, but where ours only will cover four months, so it will be perhaps less than people might expect. It to be, but I do think it should be put to good use. It was COVID related, it was to assist businesses, uh, and I think there is a strong argument for it to be used in that fashion. Uh, but of course, it will be the executive to decide that. Paul well, Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Is the Minister able to confirm whether or not any um, uh, large online retail, and I understand obviously um, many of the supermarkets we've discussed also obviously have online operations, but any online retailers such as most obviously Amazon have benefited here from rates relief? Well, they uh, would have benefited if they have premises here that, that qualified under the 12-month uh, the holiday. Uh, I can certainly find out the figures in relation to that uh, and see what it was. I have a no contact or indication from them if they did benefit from rates relief that they intend to return any of it. Call Andrew Muir. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in terms of the money that is due to be received, whilst it's in the great scheme of things there is not going to be a massive amount, there will be money there to help local businesses and also the excluded. Whether it will have to be spent in this financial year or whether we can actually have a time to properly consult with businesses and uh, scope out a scheme over the months ahead? Well, the, the rates relief money that we uh, provided to all of the businesses uh, for four months and then to the targeted businesses for the further eight months of the financial year uh, was COVID money that came via the, uh, the Barnet uh, uh, consequentials from the COVID spend in England. So uh, the clear sense of that funding was that it was to be spent within the financial year. So I am assuming and expecting uh, that if and when money is returned, uh, once that's apportioned out by the Treasury, then that will be for spending within this financial year. I call Doug Beatty. A question now, please. My department very much recognises the importance of handling absence related to mental health with sensitivity and understanding. Uh, Northern Ireland uh, uh, Civil Service uh, Human Resources is currently reviewing the way a sickness ma absence is managed through the civil service. This is an extensive piece of work which includes a review of the current policies, supporting processes, staff guides and all forms of communication to staff, including warning letters. This work will seek to ensure that the language and tone of all communications with staff who are absent for work due to underlying medical conditions, including mental health conditions, focuses on how these colleagues can best be supported. The review of sickness, absence and inefficiency sickness, absence policies is underway and will see them merge to create one single policy. The, the word inefficiency will not be included in its title. The review has been carried out in consultation with trade unions and is scheduled for completion in early 2021. Doug Beatty, uh, uh, and I thank the Minister, and I, and I particularly thank the Minister um, for saying that, that the word inefficiency will not be used um, in regards to mental health, um, because I know the Minister will understand that, that many within the prison service who have an extremely um, stressful job uh, are, are really resentful of the term um, of inefficiency in regards to their mental health. Um, uh, could I just ask that the Minister just to, to confirm for them that, that this will be removed from, from them? Yes, I, I can confirm that. I know he's raised this issue before and, and we've talked in, in this chamber about it before. I, I, I don't believe that there was an intention in, in using that term to, to, uh, to insult or to add hurt to people who were suffering from mental health, but I think there's a recognition now that it's not a correct term, in, in, I suppose, in light of what Increasingly, we know more and more about mental health and how it affects people. I think uh, there is a recognition that that term uh, was, was now redundant uh, and needed to be replaced with something better. So I'm happy to say, yes, it will be replaced and it will no longer be used in relation to that. Nicola Brogan. Jeremy Agut, Clan Corla. Um, thank you, Minister, for your answers. Can I ask you what impact has the increase of those working from home as a result of the pandemic had on absence rates? Well, the absence rates have, have dropped significantly. Uh, I, I don't have the actual figure to hand, but uh, I know that that uh, has been uh, the experience, whether it's a consequence of the pandemic and working from home, I suppose there's more research uh, to be done in relation to that. But clearly, the pandemic has accelerated us into new working arrangements, which probably would have developed over the next number of years anyway, in terms of more use of technology, uh, more remote uh, working from, from the office. Uh, and I think there are benefits to all of that. There are lessons to be learned in how that is, has worked out over the course of the pandemic. Uh, and I think one of the, the benefits that has been the reduction in, in sickness uh, among civil servants. But uh, clearly, I think when, when we get beyond this experience of the pandemic, I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned in terms of uh, working practices, the need for buildings, the need for so much office space, the ability to afford people more flexibility in terms of their working arrangements, and how that balance helps them in their own uh, daily lives. Nicole Kelly Armstrong, and uh, you won't have time for a supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Question number 10. My officials are working closely with Ulster University Economic Policy Centre and other executive departments to identify those business sectors most severely impacted by the economic consequences of the pandemic. This will allow me to determine how this relief can be applied to the best effect to support local businesses. I fully appreciate that businesses need as much clarity as possible on major costs such as rates in the longer term, and I intend to make a further statement on this in the near future. That ends end the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to topical. Question for 15 minutes, and I call Mervyn Storey. 
Mr. Speaker, Minister, you'll be aware because on a number of occasions on the floor of the House we have raised this issue with you, and we have also raised with the Justice Minister. However, her answer has been less forthcoming, and that is in regards to how and when the, your department, in conjunction with the Department of Justice, will find the additional 40 million to facilitate the commitment in the new decade, new approach, which is to increase the number of police officers. And given the focus that we have seen over recent times in regards to the activity of our police service and the challenges that they face, uh, what assurance can you give, even on the back of what you have said uh, previous to questions in the House today, around the challenges that come from 20, as we head into uh, 2021 in regards to the financial challenge? How do you see the financial challenge of the £40 million being met? Well, I, I, I agree that uh, all of the NDNA commitments we, we should be meeting. And I had discussions with the Justice Minister in relation to this. I, I think uh, there is a lead-in period required, according to the Department of Justice, to, to, to effect, give effect to this. He will know, of course, that the, uh, immediately after our NDNA agreement was reached, that the British government withdrew from a quite, a quite a substantial amount of the financial uh, promises they had made to support and underpin uh, some of the promises made in relation to that. Nonetheless, I think we have to strive to find ways to meet the obligations under NDNA as best we can. There was some £350 million in the budget in this financial year to meet them. That has not come back. We have a budget now uh, which is a slight improvement on last year, but when you absorb that amount of it, uh, it is a very, very li limited improvement on last year. So it is going to be a very challenging time ahead, particularly with the economic downturn probably a loss of income to various uh, public bodies and the executive generally across the economy. Uh, and that is going to be challenging. But nonetheless, I am committed uh, to working with the Department of Justice to see how we can meet this commitment. Because uh, unlike the Secretary of State and the Northern Ireland Office and the British Government, I think when we make a commitment under a new decade, new approach, we should do our very best to honour it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister makes reference to the £350 million, and maybe he could clarify if that £350 million is now no longer available. And if that is the case, what currently has the, the Finance Minister of unallocated monies that obviously there is a huge demand on that amount of money for a variety of services, but particularly does he see that any of that money will be used to meet the commitment in relation to the additional police officers? Well, the, the £350 million was earmarked and has been spent in this financial year, and so it is not available. Uh, that would have been a loss from our baselines. Uh, we did get a slight increase in the budget, which took account of that and gave a little bit more, uh, but it is basically a standstill budget for next year, so all departments will be uh, required, unless the executive decides to go on a, a reprioritisation exercise and reallocate money, take off some departments and add to other departments. Uh, which I think is a big undertaking at this time of the year, given that the comprehensive spending review reported very late has left us with very limited time. Uh, I have sent a, a budget paper to the executive. I would like to make a budget statement tomorrow if the executive approves that, uh, because I think we need to start the consultation process on the budget as quickly as we possibly can, uh, and not leave it to the new year, which shortens the, the consultation time. So it is going to be very challenging. There isn't additional pots of money. Uh, to, to pull from. We have some COVID money next year, but that is not what is required in terms of this commitment, uh, and it is a much less amount than we had this year. Uh, so it is going to be a challenge, but as I say, I am, I am committed to working with the Justice Department to see how we can uh, put that to effect. I call our Leah Flynn. Um, I am um, sure the Minister will be aware that um, student nurses and midwives who are currently undertaking their placements are doing so in really difficult and challenging circumstances given the outbreak um, of COVID-19. I would like to ask the Minister if he has given any consideration um, for any additional funding packages for that group of people. Thank you. Well, I, I know that uh, in the earlier part of the pandemic that the, uh, a lot of people who had not actually completed their their full term as students were, were brought up uh, and, and obviously were very willing to come into the front line of the health services. And I think that was recognised in terms of, of some payment towards them. Uh, I, I think that that has run its course, but I, I would encourage and I have encouraged the health minister to consider uh, continuing that payment. Uh, and, and we have some COVID money allocated to the Department of Health. Uh, I think that that should be continued until the pandemic has run its course, uh, certainly until the end of this financial year. Uh, uh, and so I, I would hope that, that he does that, because I think the recognition of, of the, the sacrifice that they made in terms of stepping up 
uh, people who hadn't got the full experience and were immediately being thrown into the deep end of one of the biggest challenges the health department or the health service has ever faced, then I do think that they, they merit a reward for that. Gormiogut, and I wonder can the minister confirm if he will be funding um, the Agenda for Change Pay Awards as part of the 2021 budget, please? Well, there was funding uh, as part of NDNA given to us for Agenda for Change, uh, and we, of course, as I, I was saying in my previous answer, a very challenging budget position this year. Uh, but yes, we will look to see how that, that can be met uh, within that funding and, and the budget that we have available to us. I call Jerry Kelly. Kelly. I'd like to ask the Minister, um, with the public sector workers here, will they be affected by the Chancellor's announcement uh, quite recently that there will be a pay freeze uh, next year? The public sector workers have played a vital role in delivering public services throughout the pandemic. Therefore, I was hugely disappointed that the Chancellor announced that he was freezing the pay of many hard-working public sector employees outside of those in the health service uh, for 2021-22. I understand the Treasury will not be seeking to impose this pay freeze on those workforces that the Executive has direct responsibility for. However, at the same time, the Treasury has also effectively frozen our resource budget, so any pay increases would inevitably have an impact on the spending on other vital public services. Furthermore, the pay of many staff groups here are linked to pay processes in Britain, where the freeze is being imposed by the Chancellor. So clearly this is a matter that the whole executive will need to carefully consider in the time ahead. Terry Kelly, supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for his answer up to now. And from uh, his, uh, the answer that he gave and the information that he gave, would he agree with me that it's uh, shameful that the Conservative government are yet again returning to an austerity? Um, narrative uh, seeking to penalise public sector workers uh, who, along with uh, the frontline workers we were talking about, also stepped up to deliver services uh, during the pandemic? Yes, and I, 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 I have to agree with him. I think the, probably the, the small dose of cynicism most of us had when we saw people stand outside Downing Street clapping public sector workers uh, has, has been borne uh, out by the, uh, this announcement, even if they are uh, providing some relief for health service workers. Clearly, uh, public service workers and those who provide all of those jobs which kept society going over the course of the pandemic, uh, there has been a widespread recognition of the absolute value and uh, vital nature of the work that they provide for the general public. Uh, returning to austerity, uh, and in many ways we have not escaped that, even though we had one budget, uh, which was an improvement, but the, the long-lasting effect of years of austerity meant we haven't begun to recover. Uh, so to head back in that direction, I think, is very worrying. It's the wrong policy to choose, uh, and we need to support public services and support economic growth uh, to try and improve the situation. Call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. Um, last Friday, the all-party group on climate action had excellent presentations through from people trying to take forward the Minister for Communities' um, very ambitious targets on housing. But I just wanted to ask um, you, Minister, given building uh, regulations are within your remit, um, will there be co-production and co-design happening for those building regulations so that we can ensure that things like the climate action um, considerations coming forward will be taken into effect regarding zero um, carbon emissions? Yes, we are some way behind uh, in terms of, of uh, our carbon targets uh, in relation to building regulations and, and the, the people in the department are, are playing an exercise and very quickly trying to catch up and perhaps exceed what's happening in other areas, and they are involving uh, people from the sectors, experts, who can give uh, some very valuable advice. So I'm hoping that that work is taken forward as quickly as possible, uh, because I think, yes, if we are able to embark, particularly in house building, on an ambitious uh, project uh, of construction, then we have to try and make sure that it's future-proof to meet all of the standards that we need in the time ahead. So there is some degree of catch-up to be made, but that work has been undertaken at pace to try and get us into the correct position in relation to that. Kelly Armstrong, supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, one, of the, one of the items that came forward from Climate Action was the need to um, put better um, insulation into the homes that we already have. That would be part of the ways that we can reduce emissions. So I'm just wondering that the money, obviously, for that would be enormous, but we paid an absolute fortune in corporation tax for the housing executive. Can you give us any update on how far we're getting on with the Treasury to get some of that money back? 
Well, discussions are ongoing, and I suppose if, if we, we are doing so in anticipation of a, a good outcome to that, uh, I think uh, the discussions with the Treasury haven't, uh, haven't been negative ones. Uh, let's just say that, that we, we, we are, we're hopeful of a good outcome. Of course, if money is returned to the executive, then it's up to the executive to decide how to spend that money. Uh, but I'm sure the Minister for Communities will be making a very strong pitch uh, for it to go back into housing in general terms. I call Tiamma Dolan. Minister, um, as you know, it's essential we provide equality of access for all our citizens to basic and essential facilities, and this estate should be an exemplar in doing so. Can the Minister update us on changing places facilities at the Momolan Play Park? Uh, if I can find it here. The, uh, it is an issue which we've been we've been uh, focused on very particularly in, in recent times, uh, and we have obviously had an opportunity to uh, to engage with those who are affected. So we're bringing forward provision uh, by amending the local building regulations as quickly as possible. It's proposed that the requirement here will be introduced by amending the technical guidance to the building regulations rather than a change to the regulations mirroring the approach that's been taken in administrations in Britain. Uh, and work's also progressing, as she has referenced, in, to install a change in places toilet on the storm at the state at the Bowmolan Play Park, uh, and that's due for completion by early 2021. Thank you, Minister. And, um, would you join with me in encouraging other venues to take similar steps to increase accessibility through the provision of these types of essential facilities? Yes, I certainly would, and that's why I think we, we want to move as quickly as possible in relation to the legislation. If, you, if anyone has engaged, with, particularly with parents who have had to use uh, changing facilities and toilet facilities that are not adapted to suit the particular needs uh, of young people and children who need these, then uh, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a heart-wrenching experience for them to have to change children on toilet floors. Uh, and so clearly there is a requirement uh, to provide these facilities. And I, I know we're taking the lead in relation to, because the, the work on the play park uh, down the hill will be completed ahead of the regulations, perhaps been through. So we're, we're taking the lead in relation to that. And I would hope that, that other uh, services and other uh, public bodies uh, uh, follow suit in relation to that. Justin McNulty. Minister, on the 24th of November, the Justice Minister said in this House, in relation to a proposal to increase access to legal aid for victims of domestic abuse, and I quote, that is a risky strategy to take, given the Finance Minister was clear that he agreed the bill on the basis that it did not incur additional costs. Can you confirm if this remains your position? Are you saying that there should be a price on justice for domestic abuse? Victims. No, we're not saying that at all. What we're saying is that uh, an amendment which was put forward by the committee wasn't properly thought through and had a much bigger scope in terms of the increase uh, in legal aid that would be, be there, including perhaps to some who were uh, accused of being involved in domestic abuse, and that clearly that amendment needed to be taken back and tidied up and the proper ramifications of it thought through. Uh, and so there are not only implications for the extent of legal aid available here, but there's a repercussive impact if that uh, happens in if people sought similar remedies in England, Scotland or Wales based on what has happened here. So it was very clearly the committee needed to be advised in relation to the full extent of the, the amendment that it had put forward. Uh, and I assisted the Justice Minister in providing from a financial point of view advice to them. I will hope that they will take that off and look at it and that uh, uh, an agreed approach to the uh, bill can be taken. And so we get the strongest possible protection and the strongest possible support for people in terms of legal aid. Justin McNulty, supplementary. Minister, I'm not sure if that uh, response cuts through. You're, you're still saying essentially there's a price on justice for the, the, the domestic abuse victims. Will you commit to working with the Justice Minister and my colleague, Sinead Bradley, who has undertaken an enormous amount of work in this area to ensure that the bill passes and victims of domestic abuse are not subjected to coercive financial control using restrictive legal aid rules? Well, I'm not sure whether the member hasn't listened to what I've said or he just hasn't understood what I've said. Uh, what I've said clearly is I am committed to that. What the committee and some of the amendments have put forward went far beyond what they were intending to do. So there were unforeseen consequences to some of the proposals that they were making. They need to understand the consequences to them and, and get assistance to amend them properly uh, and, and take that forward. I'm committed to seeing the strongest possible uh, legislation. 
including support for people who require legal aid. Uh, but what we want to ensure is that people who don't deserve that are people who are not intended to be caught up in, in, in relation to that uh, amendment uh, don't fall within that, and that the consequences beyond that, which I don't believe that the committee fully uh, either examined or perhaps understood, then that, that is uh, clear to them. When we are voting for legislation in this House, we need to know what we're voting for. And, uh, so I think absolute clarity is needed in relation to all of those matters so we can get the best possible legislation that supports victims of domestic violence. Members, time is up. Members, I have received notification from the members of the Business Committee of a motion to extend the sitting past 7 p.m. on the standing order.